the first time I heard Gustav Mahler's music was indirectly through the television. I was a very young boy, and it was in the early 1960s. And I heard uh, the second movement of the first symphony uh, explained and then conducted by Leonard Bernstein in the New York Philharmonic. And it was on a very, well, what now has become a famous uh, television series called the Young Persons Concerts. Probably if I could ask a question of Mahler, it would be on a more personal side, which would be, how did he enjoy his time in the United States of America? Um, and in what ways might have his American time influenced his composition? We see in Mahler, in his writing of the music, that um, it is a very modern approach. There is so much um, uh, virtuosity in the technique of which he writes in these flexible aspects, these ideas of, of um, simultaneous events taking place, but yet at the same time carefully written out so that, that uh, spontaneity can be repeated over and over again through simply realizing carefully the score. Um, there is a surviving recording of Bruno Walter rehearsing a part of a symphony, one of the Mahler symphonies, and one sees how carefully um, he, uh, he uh, serves the written text of the music to make sure that this flexibility or spontaneity uh, in the end comes out. This is, includes then within an inherent danger that uh, as we spoke about just before, that putting upon the Mahler score yet a further emphasis on yet more flexibility can sometimes result in a, in a performance that's really not very appropriate. One has the distinct impression that Bruno Walter is serving the music, that he's there as a servant of the art form, that somehow He's taking extreme care to work with this great masterpiece from what is contained within the work and not bringing in uh, uh, or any sorts of outside impositions. If we were thinking of a different sort of context, you, you could think of a, of, a, of a minister or a priest reciting the liturgy reciting the liturgy, there's a sense of service or a sense of trying to share the content of the liturgy from based upon what lies within. And perhaps because Mahler was such a, a great master a musician, a master artist, who also had the capability of being a great director of an opera house and all of the complexities that uh, a director of an opera house has to deal with. It allowed him at the same time uh, to have a very, very rich environment in, in which his an imagination could go much, much further. Uh, I mentioned that there are many works of Mahler that the theatrical elements or the dramatic elements are are undeniable. We feel them through both intellectually and emotionally, and sometimes even physically when he sets offstage uh, components to the uh, to his uh, performance scores. Um, perhaps his imagination was somehow fertilized by the environment in which he was working. Today, if one looks back to the beginning of the 20th century, one normally thinks of, of Schoenberg as, as the great inventor, as the one who, who broke old forms and then and established a new language. And as, in a sense, that's true. But in another sense, perhaps Schoenberg was the most traditional of all composers. But Mahler, um, yes, he inherited the harmonic form of the 19th century, and yes, he pushed it to the point of where it was beginning to collapse, where it was beginning to break. But moreover, he took 
uh, formal structures and completely redefined them and, and worked far, far beyond uh, what the normal structures of his contemporaries were. Probably that's why uh, Das Klagende Lied, when he submitted it to the jury with, uh, with Johannes Brahms, Brahms had a terrible impression of what, uh, what the young Gustav Mahler was like. He felt that he was simply um, uh, a composer without discipline. Um, the, the, in breaking what would be seen as constraints or structures, this certainly is something that opened up huge pathways into the composers of the 20th century. In terms of how we thought of the orchestra, with this vast orchestration, um, of course he shared this with the Impressionists who were working in other countries at the time, but these very, very large palettes of, of orchestral um, colors that he could weave together were in themselves um, radical. But perhaps what was most radical was that he would use these, these gigantic orchestras and he would define structure in different ways, not only through tempo relationships, but also with tutti versus kama or chamber ensembles from within the orchestra, from transparency with um, compact density, um, with the linear aspects of, of contrapoint, which Mahler was a master, compared with great vertical homophonic structures, these great chorales that Mahler could also write. All of these contrasts of klang, and how they come out of different combinations of orchestration. When the chord is exactly the same chord, but in different forms comes different clown, was something that composers obviously referred to again and again in our own times, leading eventually to the, to the spectral ideas that we have. with many other composers. One, one can see through studying the, the scores that there are times when the most radical or inventive or imaginative explosion of expression comes with the very first uh, score. With um, the final version of this Klagener Lied, I, um, I, well, I could admit that it was, um, it had very, very uh, interesting parts to the work. I was never really inspired to perform the work in, in, the, in the final version. But looking over the the score to the very first Wolfhassung and being confronted with, with these wild statements of bitonality, simultaneous um, uh, rhythms taking place, controlled chaos, um, uh, as you say, overwhelmingly uh, dramatical statements that were upheld by uh, an extraordinarily large orchestra. It, to me, was a thrilling and undeniable statement of the young Mahler that the future was now, that Mahler was a pioneer, not only a radical, but a pioneer. Sometimes radicals destroy more than they create, but pioneers lead to discovery. Again, we, we can't answer this, and it, it's very presumptuous to anyone who dares to answer the question. Only the person themselves can answer it. We can only look objectively uh, to what's left behind, to have maybe uh, an idea or a glimpse of what might have been. Through the music that Mahler left behind, to the writings that he left behind. Fortunately, there are many writings, many letters. Um, 
we can see that uh, Mahler wanted what all humans want, which was somehow a universe in which there was there were positive things to be felt. The music of Mahler, I think, is an expression of life, life's reality. And in this way, it made him uh, a very important um, composer in that he was able to express this life's reality at a time where we who live today, facing the complications of, of the world that cannot be explained and somehow cannot be resolved, there is no solution. He can offer us, um, through his artwork, uh, through his great music, um, expressions of humanity that somehow offer a context or a perspective. So that probably was not something that he particularly wanted, uh, but through his dreams, um, which he wrote about, uh, we can have a feeling to, to perhaps where this extraordinary sensitivity came from.